Many of God's children are spiritual POWs, prisoners of war, trapped in a sin that they have been unable to break. Trapped in a situation that is contrary to the will and word of God from which they have not been able to escape. Whether it is alcoholism or drugs or pornography or gluttony or profanity, whether it is lashing out in anger and wrath and inability to control one's temper, they find themselves caught and unable to get out. There is a whole addiction industry today to help people get out of the vice grip that is holding them illegitimately hostage. And what many are discovering is that going to church hadn't solved their problem. Praying hasn't released them from it. I want to talk about the consequence of addiction that shreds minds, ruins souls, kills relationships because you find yourself caught. And even if that's not you, there is somebody in your circle of influence who finds themselves addicted. The biblical word for what the world calls addiction is stronghold. Because the biblical word stronghold is referring to the spiritual nature of the addiction. A stronghold is a spiritually based addiction, which means if you try to feel, fix an addiction, which is really a stronghold, without the right spiritual connection, you can't be released from it because you haven't dealt with the core issue that's behind it. So you just deal with the thing itself. In your kitchen, whether you have a refrigerator or a stove or an electric can opener or a toaster or whatever appliance you have, all of them are different, but they all find their power from the same source, electricity. Regardless of your addictions, it would take us forever to talk about this addiction and that addiction and this addiction and that addiction and this other addiction because they are, they come in by the dozens. But I would like to submit to you that they all emanate from a common source. So if we can get to the common source, we can apply that source to the uniqueness of the particular spiritual addiction slash stronghold that needs to be addressed. We're living in a time when people find themselves stuck. Now my concern is not for the person who's stuck and wants to be, because I can't help you. If you're in an addiction and you want to stay addicted, all the facts and figures and truth and Bible can't change something you are pursuing. But I am speaking to those who are or who know someone who is caught in a sin, know they are caught, doesn't want to be caught, but doesn't know how to get out. They are trapped in some scenario for which they cannot find release. And so this issue of illegitimate bondage must have a spiritual understanding underpinning it for full release to occur. 
So let's review again what we're referring to as we move forward. We're referring to a spiritually based trap in some category of life that has been inculcated with negative patterns of thought that like a snake has wrapped itself around the mind making something seem impossible to break or to fix because you feel handcuffed to it or it feels handcuffed to you. It is seeing something as unchangeable that is outside of the will and the word of God. Most people have run into something in their lives. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they are small, that is of less consequence, but yet addictions have a way of growing. They have built into them gateway potential. The capacity to expand themselves in our lives and in our circumstances. When you are in an addiction or better yet a spiritual addiction or stronghold, you feel like you're in a tomb, a prison, and somebody is thrown away the key. What many people seek to do with this stronghold that they're battling is to accept it as an inevitable reality and the best they hope to do with it is to decorate their cell. Since it's never going to change, at least let me make my addiction as pleasant as possible. Other people settle for what we might call sin management. Since I'm never going to get rid of it, let me do like a trash masher. Let me just press it down and pretend it's not there, which only creates room for more trash. And so they just try to manage it the best way they can. But today, I want to try to give a biblical mechanism for deliverance predicated on an understanding that Christians can find themselves in strongholds like non-Christians. You don't have to be saved for long to know that when you got saved, your flesh didn't disappear. Some of our flesh was so well trained when we weren't saved that when we got saved, the flesh looked at that as a new opportunity to show how strong it really is. Even the most spiritual person in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, struggled with something he couldn't shake. In Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 24, Paul says he was doing things he did not want to do. He said he told himself, you shouldn't do it. He said the willing was there. I was really serious, but the ability to pull it off wasn't. I kept promising God I'm not going to do it again. I kept promising God I struggled between my flesh and my salvation. And the two were not getting along. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and gave him life, the Bible says he came up from his tomb tied up in his hands and his feet. Just because he had life didn't mean he was free. Jesus had to say, y'all got to loose him and let him go. I gave him life, but he needs freedom. So it is possible to have come to Christ, have eternal life, and still not yet be free from whatever the stronghold or spiritual addiction happens to be. And so this thing 
called strongholds, spiritual addictions, is spiritual slavery in some category of life, which is why he calls it in verse 14, a slave to sin. If you a slave, that means you have a master. He calls the master sin. He doesn't call it a bad habit. He doesn't call it a mistake. He doesn't call it something that you know you need to just get over. He calls it something that is in antithesis to the will and word of God. So let's call the addiction, whatever category it is, what it is. No, you don't just have a struggle. You got a sin master. No, you didn't just make a mistake over and over and over again. You had a master called sin because if you don't know who your master is, then you won't address it for what it is. He calls it slavery, being under the whip of an entity that he calls sin. How does this stronghold or spiritual addiction, whatever category it is, occur? Because understanding the cause will lead us to the cure. When you're sick and you go to the doctor, he's going to try to find the cause so he can give you the right cure. Many of us are trying to cure the wrong cause. So we're medicating something that's not the problem and wonder why we're not getting healthier spiritually. To understand this, stay with me here, I want you to follow me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we all need this, either for ourselves or for someone else. And so it is critical that you understand this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 2 says, I ask that when I am present, I need not to be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The problem of addiction, a sin that has mastered you or us or me, the problem of addiction has to do with a lofty thing. Okay, you see that phrase? He says, this lofty thing in verse 5 has been raised up against the knowledge of God. So let me define the lofty thing. The Greek word lofty, a synonym for it is partition. You go to a room, we have classrooms that have a partition down the middle. You can open it or you can close it. If we want to have two classrooms in the same space, we close the partition. This partition is lofty. It goes from the floor to the ceiling and we close it to divide the room so that we can have two separate classes as opposed to having one bigger class. So we divide it through a lofty thing. Now the reason we divide the room is so the information in this half of the room doesn't cross over to the meeting in that half of the room. We want the content to be separated so that one room is not interfering with another room. What Paul is saying is 
The reason why we stay defeated is because of our partition in the mind. There is a blockage in the mind. He says speculations and thoughts raised up, petitioned out against the knowledge of God. So what the enemy does is he sets up a partition in the mind so that the truth of God can't get through. And because he partials off your thinking, your speculation, and your thoughts, no matter how many sermons you hear, it can't cross over to the other room. Because the other room is filled with contradictory information that the enemy doesn't want the knowledge of God to cross over into. He calls this other information in the other half of the room, your partial off uh, mind, he calls that information knowledge and speculation against the knowledge of God. So the lofty thing is contradicting what God says, what God thinks, so that it doesn't go all the way through. So what happens is that the enemy is able to keep the truth of God from fully infiltrating your thought patterns so that you have victory one moment and defeat another moment. This blocking through a lofty thing keeps what he calls in verse 4 the fortress, prison, or tomb operating. So the moment you think you're getting out, you find out you're still in. Because it didn't cross over. It, it did, the partition made sure it didn't cross over. Now the biblical word for this lofty thing is double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. Double to mind thought, thinking in two different directions at the same time. Partition. It is the job of Satan to keep you thinking in two ways at the same time. He doesn't mind you getting God's thoughts on Sunday as long as in the other room you have his thoughts on Monday. Because if he can get you to have God's thoughts on Sunday but get his thoughts on Monday, he can keep God's thoughts from penetrating the whole of you. Therefore, God's thoughts don't last long because they're in competition. It's like uh, if you... If you go to Sweet Georgia Browns, because you want some soul food, you go to Sweet Georgia Brown. You come to the end of the line and order a Diet Coke. <laughs> hoping that somehow that will cancel out all the sugar and grease at Sweet Georgia Browns. You just feel better because you ordered a Diet Coke after greens and fried chicken and fried ribs and mac and cheese and potato salad and sweet potato pie. But give me a Diet Coke. What a lot of folk think is having Diet Church on Sunday after having incorporated the other world view all week long, somehow that diet worship will override and give you victory. He says, no, you're operating with a partition. And that partition cancels out the knowledge of God, making it incapable of your mind being able to take every thought captive to the obedience to Christ. So the prison, the fortress, 
doesn't get dismantled and after a while we get too tired of trying to dismantle it. We get too tired of trying to get, I'm too tired of fighting this thing. So the best I can do is put pictures on the wall of myself. I'm in this, I'm going to die like this, it's going to always be like this, so I'm just going to do the best I can. Or manage it the best I can. So in order for the penetration of God's truth to bring victory in the area of the stronghold due to the vice grip of sin that has been amplified by Satan and demons, in order for that to be overcome, that wall must be taken down in order that the fortress, the prison, might be destroyed, not remodeled. And the tricky part of this, the tricky part is that the other part of the room, the part that's not from God, feels right a lot of the time. It reminds me of Matthew 16, beginning verse 21. Jesus, Jesus is telling the disciples, look, he says, look, I, I got to go, die, rise from the dead. Peter says, come here. Come here, Jesus. You and I got to have a conversation. Peter takes Jesus to the side and says, God forbid it, Lord. What you just said, Jesus, you all wrong. You off. And you're off, watch this, in the name of God. He says, I'm going to use God on you, Jesus. You really got to be good to use God on Jesus. He said, I'm going to use God on you, Jesus. God forbid what you just said. What you just said is not going to happen. And just to keep it spiritual, Lord. What you just said is not going to happen, Lord. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Wait a minute. How can you just call Peter Satan when he used God's name? So just because you use God's name, says God bless you, say hallelujah, praise the Lord, does not make it legit. Does not make it legit. He says, get thee behind me, devil. Now what was devilish about his statement? He meant well. He was trying to keep Jesus from the cross. He was trying to keep Jesus from being killed. He meant well. He even used God's name in it. He called Jesus Lord. He meant well. But Jesus says, no, your mind is on man's view, not on God's view because you didn't like the view. See, the reason why Satan can keep us track is when we don't like what God wants and come to some logical conclusion about it that we can toss a little Jesus name on top of it, we think then, then it must be okay when it's the devil controlling the other side of the room of our minds. And when we understand this, and grasp this. It becomes a transforming truth that, wait a minute, I have a divided mind and that's why it doesn't stick. It stays there for a day or a week, but it doesn't stick. And even when it comes back, I don't have victory over it. It has victory over me. So if that's the problem, how do we do this? How do, we, how do we do this? How do we begin now to remove the petition so there is no longer a division in the mind so that now God's knowledge flows through and the fortress is destroyed and all the speculation that's holding me hostage? Back to our original passage, John 8. He says in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then you will know, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. 
you only are going to be freed by the truth. Okay? Now, nobody will disagree with that, so let me say it another way. You will only be freed by the truth, not what you believe to be true. We got folk running around here talking about, I know my truth. Yeah, and where has your truth gotten you? No, no, no. It's not what you believe to be true. He's not talking about a truth, some truth, your truth. He's talking about the truth. The truth refers to an absolute standard by which reality is measured. It is an absolute standard by which reality is measured and the truth always sits outside of you. Look, one and one is two, one and one has always been two, and one and one will always be two because it is a mathematical truth. Now you can feel three-ish all you want. You can be in the one and one being three all day long. But because it is a fact that sits outside of you, you have to adjust yourself to one and one being two, no matter how many people tell you it's three, no matter how deeply you feel it's three, no matter how much you want it to be three, you must conform to the truth, not turn it into your truth. And one of the reasons people stay in strongholds is because they're living on a truth or their truth or some TV program's truth or some cultural truth and not the truth. The absolute standard by which reality is revealed. Here is one of the biggest falsehoods that keep us in custody and locked up spiritually in a stronghold a spiritual addiction and that is trying to get the flesh to fix the flesh Paul said in the scripture we just read in 2 Corinthians 10 we do not war according to the flesh the flesh can't fix the flesh you can try to manage it you can try to force it down. You can try to make a New Year's resolution. You can promise you're never going to do it again. You can talk to yourself. You can go to the counselor. You can take medication. But if it's a spiritual sin issue, what we do is go to the thing that's the problem to fix the problem. He says no. What you must do first and foremost is continue in my truth. Look, look, uh, you remember, you remember uh, your grandmother, great-grandmother, when she was washing clothes, used the washing board. You know, she pushed the washing board. And she putting out a lot of energy to, to, to clean them clothes. I mean, arms get tired, have to take a break for a while, come back and do it again. And then you got a lot of clothes. You know, it takes days to do it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard work to clean those clothes with the washing board. But lo and behold, technology, a washing machine. <laughs> a washing machine. What would you say if you purchased a washing machine for your grandmother and she was using a washing board. You would say, Mama, uh, Grandma, you don't get it. You don't need that when you have this. All you're doing is the best you can, breaking your neck, getting tired, when there has been another provision that's much better than you at getting stuff clean. What many people want to do is get out of their addiction by their own scrubbing effort. And for a while, it looks like it's clean, but when they look it up, it ain't that clean. And, and they try again, they try again. When God says, no, 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 what you must do, watch this, verse 31, he says, I want you to continue in my truth and you will know the truth. The word continue means to hang out, abide, stay there, to loiter. That's what to continue or abide is. 
You must abide in the truth. Stay, there, stay with me here. We don't abide in the truth, we visit it. We've come, we're listening to the word of God. Most of us won't know next Sunday what we heard this Sunday, okay? Because we don't abide in it, we visit it. No, he says, no, no, no. No, no, no. To have victory over the master of sin, you must abide in the truth. So if you are battling something in your life and you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, that's a whole other ball game because you don't have the spirit to help you. But if you are a Christian, you have the spirit, but the spirit is the spirit of truth, so you've got to abide in the truth. So here's what I want you to do this week. Every day, I want you to read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Th that, those three chapters, Romans 6, 7, and 8. Why? Because Romans 6, 7, and 8 is going to tell you the truth about the master called sin, whatever that sin is. In chapter 6, Paul is going to tell you about your new identity in Christ. He's going to tell you, you've been baptized with Christ and you are not who you used to be because you were buried with him in baptism, raised with him into a new life so that Sin is lying to you. When you go to a 12-step program, guess what they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you to stand up and give your name. Hello, my name is Bill, and I am an alcoholic. That's what they're going to tell you to say. The Bible's going to disagree with that. Paul's going to say in Romans 6, that's not who you are. That may be what you're doing, but that's not who you are. You are a blood-bought completely converted son or daughter of the living God that has a problem with alcohol. Paul's going to tell you to shift your identification in your newness in Christ and therefore, verse 11 of chapter 6, consider your old person dead. That's not who you are. My name is Bob and I am gay. No, that's how you feel. He's going to tell you, you must now identify yourself as Jesus Christ identifies you because the more you tell yourself you're that, you're telling the flesh to be at home with the sin. Then he's going to come to chapter 7 and he's going, Paul's going to tell you, I struggled like you struggled. I had some things in my life. He doesn't tell us what it is, which is good because then you can put your stuff in that chapter. He says, and I struggled, and the things I didn't want to do, the things I did, and I didn't want it, and it kept coming back, and, and I resisted it, but it showed up again until I got to chapter 8 and understood the power of the Holy Spirit and that the law of the Spirit is greater than the law of sin and death. So that in verse 13, he says, therefore, I have no longer any obligation to the flesh. When I understood that I got this supernatural peace when it's tied to the truth. And you will know the truth. Now I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, well, I may know it, but, but a lot of that Bible stuff, I'm reading it, but I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Okay. Do you take medicine you don't understand? You go to the doctor, you say, I'm hurting. He writes a prescription. You don't know what he wrote. In fact, if you can read what he wrote, he ain't a real doctor. He got scribble stuff going. You don't know what that says. You go to the pharmacist, you get the medicine. You, you, you don't know all the stuff that's in that medicine. But what you do is you ingest it, you take it, you swallow it, and it does its work even when you don't understand it. Now, sure, we are to seek to understand the word of God, but while you are taking the time to seek it, if you just keep taking it in and continue it, it has the ability to do its work if you continue in it. So if you are struggling with something, if you are a believer, every day for this week, 
Read chapter 6, 7, and 8 of the book of Romans over and over again and let the medicine seep down and abide in you because when you continue in my word, you will then know the truth and the truth will set you free. It becomes part of your soul. It's, it's been ingested and we don't do that. We listen to a sermon on Sunday. That's diet church. Today we live in a world of information but little truth. We appeal to our feelings which are changing all the time. Our reason which is uncertain and our moral instincts which are different from person to person. Ah, but there's something else. There's something else that if you miss it, you miss the real deal of victory. He just said, if you will continue in my word, if you hang out there, if you bring your, the master of sin that you're dealing with and you lay it before the word, and you lay it before the word, Lord, this is what I'm dealing with, but I'm reading your word, I'm taking this word, I'm taking this word, I'm taking that 15 minutes, that 30 minutes every day, and I'm going to get this thing till you get it down in me, and my soul begins to grab hold of it and wraps itself around it. He says, the truth will make you free. But look at another verse. Because when you look at verse 36, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, we, we, we got a little issue here. Because verse 32 says, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? That's what it says. But in verse 36 it says, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. In the first one, the truth will make me free. But in the second one, the sun sets me free. In the first one, I'm free. But in the second one, I'm free indeed. So what's the difference between being made free and being set free? And what's the difference between being free and free indeed? What, what, what's the difference here? If somebody comes and you're in jail and comes up to you and says, someone has just posted bail for you, you're going to shout. You're going to applaud. Somebody has paid what you need to get out. You're going to say, yeah, 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 I'm free, but you're still in jail. <laughs> you're free because bail has been posted, but you're not out. But you are free because once you post bail that has been accepted, you're free. But then they got to do paperwork. They got to do the paperwork. So, so there is often a gap between legally being free and being out. The word of God post bail. But the son has the key to the lock. The bail makes you free. The son sets you free. In other words, it is not merely the knowledge of the Bible. It is the relationship with the author that produces the experience of the freedom that you have. When you spend time in the word, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It says it's alive. The book is alive. It's a book, but it's alive. 
okay? Now, let me tell you what the book does according to Hebrews 4.12. He says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God, when taken in, will divide soul and spirit. The reason why we stay trapped in certain things is because the soul and spirit are not divided. They're all mixed up. They're all, they're all intertwined because things have not been separated. So that which is God is God and that which is not is not. So we didn't got it all mixed together. But he says when the word of God does its cutting, it separates the soul and the spirit so that they become two distinct realities and you know what's what. See, Paul was struggling with, how can I not want to do this and do it? I, I'm confused. I, I, I can't make sense of that. He says the word of God, shoom. Cuts between the two, so the two are segmented. But then after he says that, he comes to verse 13 and he says, and all things are laid bare before his eyes. So in verse 12, he's talking about the word of God, but in verse 13, he's talking about his eyes. So he takes the word written and God the person and when the living word connects with the written word in your heart, soul, and mind, not only is Baal posted, but Jesus comes with a key. And when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Guess what indeed is? Luke 24, 34 says, when Jesus rose from the dead, they said he has risen indeed. Why did they have to say indeed? Because Jesus Christ never stopped living after he died on the cross. After Jesus died on the cross, he was very much alive on Saturday as he was on Friday. In fact, the scripture says that on Saturday, he went to Sheol to preach victory to the souls that had died. So Jesus Christ was as alive on Saturday as he was on Friday, but his body on Saturday was still laying in the tomb. He was spiritually alive, but he was not physically alive yet. But as the preacher would say, early on Sunday morning, just a little while before day, Jesus got up so that what was already true became visible. What was already real, you could see it. It's one thing to be in jail and to hear somebody's posted bail. It's a whole bunch of other stuff when folks see you walk out of the jail house and see that you are free. Jesus made his freedom visible on Sunday morning. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. But folk in Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas didn't find out about it till June 19th, 1865. So there was a gap between legal freedom and there was a gap between the experience of freedom. Not because the proclamation hadn't been signed, it was because folk didn't know about it. So one reason you can stay a slave is because nobody told you how to be free. Oh, but there's another way you can stay a slave. Somebody can tell you that you are free but you've gotten so used to living on the plantation that you don't exercise the freedom that you have. So a lot of folks stayed in slavery who had been set free because they had gotten so used to being there, they didn't want to take the risk of freedom. On the cross, Jesus signed your emancipation proclamation. And everybody who trusts Christ is redeemed. But Satan doesn't want you to know that. He wants a petition up in your mind so that you don't believe you can walk in freedom. But I'm here to tell you today that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. But only if you continue in his word. You continue in his word, you call on the Son, and then you can declare like a great man a few years ago in 1963 in Washington, D.C., free at last, free at last. I thank God Almighty with my stronghold, I'm free at last. 
God knows what you're like. He knows our propensity and he has compassion when we come home. Come back home as quickly as possible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So whatever inheritance, whatever God still wants to do for you, to you, through you, in you, don't lose anymore. Jesus Christ broke the curse. So don't ever talk about you being cursed again if you know Jesus Christ. The curse, the consequence of the law is broken. The greatest miracle of all is when you dip yourself in the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. We have become a sex-saturated society. TV, music, Smart devices all give us access to and permission for this particular sin. It has become the drug of choice within the culture. And as the culture has devolved, increasing in that devolution of the culture has been promiscuity gone crazy. There used to be shame associated with it, guilt associated with it. Now it's become like McDonald's drive through fun. Or even worse yet, 24 hour stop and go. And it is wreaking havoc in our world. Unwanted and unplanned pregnancies creating whole industries that are supported by the government to facilitate the abortions of the children that are not wanted due to the sexual activity. Creating a response even by the church to promote life and not to abort but the high cost involved in even doing that as a result of the consequence of the sin. Diseases have run rampant. STDs are coming in all shapes and sizes as the medical community has to amp up to fight against the consequences of the sexual free-for-all that the culture has endorsed and that far too many within the culture, even Christians, have adopted. When we look at our own struggles, when we look at our own lives, we can see back areas of disobedience in this area that has cost us. There are many who can look back and say with regret, I wish I hadn't. There are many who've been used, abused, and thrown away when playtime was over. Sex was created by heaven, not by Hollywood. It was God's idea and God's creation, and the Bible says, and what he created was good. Satan is an expert at taking what has been created by God for good and to turn it around against us for bad. In Genesis chapter 6, he opens up the chapter with the world having to be destroyed in the first seven verses because demons inhabited men who had relations with women giving birth to children and all manner of wickedness, so the whole world had to be destroyed. So Satan used sex in order to get women pregnant, in order for wickedness to spread, so that God has to now send a flood and judge the whole world because it was viewed as irredeemable. International consequence for rebellion in this area. And the problem with this particular area is it is the most 
natural area to sin in because it is birthed out of a natural God-given desire. It's not where you have to go out there and find something. It's the something is already there. It's built into our human makeup. So let's start off with why it was created. God created sex, since it comes from heaven, not Hollywood, to inaugurate and renew a covenant, a marriage covenant. That's why it was created. So it was not merely for entertainment. It was a covenant that was entertaining. What the culture has done is remove the covenant but want to maintain the entertainment. And therefore, a major purpose of it, the major purpose of it, has been ripped from the definition of it. Now, Paul gives an extended discussion of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I do want you to turn there because he gives a theological understanding of this area that we need to take into account as we move forward here today. We're being somewhat didactic or teaching today because I want you to understand it. I want us to understand it so that we can, no matter where you're starting from, begin to acclimate ourselves in order to recover what God's will will allow and the consequences of our rebellion here. He says in verse 9 of uh, chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or adulterers or the effeminate or homosexuals or thieves or covetousness or drunkards or revilers or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. He says, this lifestyle blocks you from inheriting the kingdom of God. Now, don't misunderstand that. He doesn't say it stops you from entering the kingdom of God. You enter the kingdom of God based on faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but you inherit the kingdom of God. That is, you accrue the benefits of the kingdom of God having to do with lifestyle. So while you may be on your way to heaven, heaven may not be on its way to you. Because when you adopt this lifestyle, he says that inheriting, that is receiving the benefits of the kingdom, do not accrue to you. He says in verse 14, such were some of you. That's, that's, how, that's how you rolled in your unsaved days. But you were washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not who you are now. Now, it may be how you feel, but that's not who you are. That we've been duped in the thinking, it's only natural. The desire is natural. The activity is not. He takes it deeper theologically. He says, all things, verse 12, are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I am not mastered by anything. So whenever anything in your Christian life, my Christian life, our Christian life holds us hostage, it is spiritually illegal. He says, I will be mastered or controlled by nothing, including my passions. I have them, but I'm not going to let them rule me. He takes it deeper. Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. Because Corinthians had this problem. They had this problem. They had this sexual immorality problem. People had come out of that lifestyle and now they were in church, but that's what they knew. That's how they functioned. That's how they rolled. And they had a, they had a philosophy. Their philosophy is food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food. Translation, you have an appetite. When you have an appetite and you're hungry, you go eat. 
because you got a stomach, your stomach is growling for food, so you go get the thing that's out there designed to satisfy what your stomach is crying out for in order for your stomach not to cry out for it anymore because food was made to satisfy the cry of the stomach because the body is crying out to be relieved and to be satisfied. So just like the stomach cries out for food and you satisfy the stomach for food, when the body calls for sex, then you go start knocking boots. That's just what you do. They were saying that that is the natural expression of the desire. God intervenes into this discussion and he says that is not correct. He says, while food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, he says, yet your body, verse 13, is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. So your body is not for anything you want to do with it, just because it's your body. And he explains why. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. In other words, if God got Jesus up from the grave, he can get you up from the illegitimate bed because he's in the resurrections. So since he's in the resurrections, just as he got Jesus up out of the grave, he can get you out of that yielding to that legitimate passion that's being addressed in an illegitimate way. He then goes deeper. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, and the two shall be one. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. He says, when you have sex, you enter into a union. You enter into a union. And you are now, as a Christian, unified with Christ. So wherever you go, you take him with you. Impactful, amazing, intense, thought-provoking. That's how just a few students describe their experience since enrolling in the Tony Evans Training Center. The best part is, the Training Center is wherever you and your online connection are. Going beyond a Sunday sermon, these compelling Bible study courses take a much deeper look at Scripture, the Bible's writers, social issues of today, and so much more. Log on today to learn more at TonyEvansTraining.org. TonyEvansTraining.org. Explore the kingdom anytime, anywhere. Flee immorality, verse 18, for every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. He says that this sin is unlike any other sin because of the unique internal damage it does to the soul. What he says is this sin is unique because when you disconnect from it, you take some of your soul with it. And it's not hard to testify that that's what happens in scenarios that Paul is describing. He goes deeper. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. You are not your own, you have been purchased. He makes an interesting statement. He says, your body is the temple of the living God. A temple is a house of worship. So whenever you have sex, you have church. It was designed to be a worship experience because he says it is a temple. Temple is a place of worship. You are to glorify God, he says, with your temple because it was designed for the establishment of the, and the renewal of a covenant. And so... He wants us to understand the seriousness, the depth of this matter. So much and so that Hebrews 13, 4 says, 
fornicators and adulterers he will judge. Therefore, sex for the believer is not merely a physical thing, nor is it merely an emotional thing. It becomes a spiritual thing. Now we have a problem. And the problem is that there is the reality of life. There is this reality that we've been through things, we've done things, we've looked at things, been entertained by things, we've denigrated ourselves into things, and we pay the price for that. If stories were told across the room of regrets, of mistakes, of sins, of disobedience, of iniquity, of transgressions, of failures, of whatever would be the best word to describe the departure from God and its consequence, economically, spiritually, relationally, psychologically, emotionally, the testimonies would be replete because of all the different background and experiences that are represented in the room. And so the question becomes, well, what do we do now? How do we recover? How do we beat back whatever consequences that God has allowed to take place because his standard has been violated at whatever level and for however long that violation has occurred? Because of a situation that happened in John 8. The scribes bring a woman to Jesus while he's teaching in the temple and they say to him, teacher, because you're teaching Jesus, we caught this woman in adultery in the very act. And when they say, what should we do? Jesus stooped down, the end of verse 6, and with his finger began writing on the ground. But they kept pressing him. What are we going to do with her? Verse 7. Jesus says, he that is without sin cast the first stone. But he stoops down again and he writes again. They said, the law of Moses said we should stone her. So they are thinking about the law and talking about the law and the divine standard is on their minds for the test they are doing. Jesus kneels, kneels down and writes once. He that is without the sin casts the first stone. He kneels down and writes a second time. So if you're telling me you've never been immoral, if you're telling me you've never done this or that or the other, throw the first stone. You, you, you lead the way. So I can be true to the law of Moses, but I just want you to know just so you know, after you've thrown your stone and we call your number, just make sure you understand some rocks are coming your way. And so Jesus, as only Jesus could do, threw the same law in their face that they were throwing at him. It says that they began to walk away. So now it's just Jesus and the woman. It's just Jesus and the lady. So they're standing there and Jesus straightening up says to her in verse 10, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Where are the people at? I don't see them. Where, where, uh, nobody here throwing no stones. And she says, no one, Lord. Now the scribes that call Jesus teacher, she calls him Lord. She affirms the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. No one, Lord. My accusers are not here. 
And then Jesus hits her with the mother load. A short statement, but pregnant with theological truth. I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. And I want me taking away your condemnation to be the motivation for you to go and sin no more. The law says, I'm going to hurt you because of what you've done. God does not change the law, the standard. It's still sin. But what grace does is shift the motivation. In other words, I want you to respond to me out of the fact that what could have happened didn't happen. Even when the Lord disciplines us, the Bible says, he disciplines us for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So even consequences of discipline come out of a heart of love. He wants the motivation for the transformation to be the goodness he extends to you even though you deserve stones. But what do you do if you already messed up, you already blown it, you already suffering the consequences, you're hurting from it, you're disappointed at it, but you're saying like she said, Jesus, Lord, 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 I, I'm, I recognize you and I want that grace and whatever the grace and the mercy will allow in terms of me moving forward since I can't change yesterday. Wish I could, if I could, I would, but I can't. But I'm here today and I want to go different tomorrow. Well, most of us do this. We send our clothes to the cleaners when they get dirty, right? We send our clothes to the cleaners because they're stained. So you take your clothes to the cleaners and they begin their process of cleaning it up. You go back and you pick up your clothes the next week. You know why you send your clothes to the cleaners? Because you want to wear them. See, you want to wear them again, so you want them clean and pressed and, 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 and you want to, because you want to look good in your clothes, so you take them to the clean. So what I'm trying to tell you is Jesus has a cleaning business. He's got a cleaning business, and he knows you can't get it clean like he can get it clean. So he says, if you will bring your dirt to me, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you bring your dirt to me, and you recognize who I am and what I have to offer. In fact, not only do you bring your clothes to me, but I got a pickup service. I will meet you because I want to get rid of this dirt. And the reason why I want you to bring your dirt to me is because I want to wear you. And I want to look good in you. And I want when you say I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to be well dressed. I want you to be well pressed. I want you to look good so that you can show me off. And if any folk from your past come up wanting to stone you because they remember what you used to be and what you used to do and how you used to act, you can show them the new jacket. You can show them the new pants. You can show them the new shirt. You can show them the new tie. They say, yeah, I used to be dirty, but I've been to the cleaners and Jesus Christ has washed me white as snow. One of the great challenges of life is our sexuality. We've been given it in our humanity and God has given us parameters for the exercising of it. But when that fire leaves the fireplace, stuff starts to burn down, doesn't it? Our own lives, our own guilt, our own relationships, because it's a fire run wild. It has left the compartment that God has created for it, which is, of course, marriage. But I've got good news for you today. God forgives. Throughout the Bible, you see many sexual failures but you also see the forgiveness and grace of God healing those who have disobeyed him in this area. The Bible makes this a unique sin because it's a covenantal sin. 
and it affects you and your well-being as well as others who are affected by immorality. One of the great things that God does in the Bible is that he sanctifies sex. He doesn't make it a bad thing. He doesn't make it a negative thing. He calls it a beautiful thing. In fact, there's a whole book that celebrates sex, Song of Solomon. So God is not against it, he's for it. He wants to promote it. He just wants you to have a high view of marriage for it. But when we have operated outside of it and are bearing the consequences of it, and there are many illustrations of that in the Bible, uh, he has a cleaning service. He can clean us up. He can uh, wash us. He can iron us so that we become spiritually pure again and can go on with our